Welcome to Balthazar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth, a series of conversations about the life and teachings of Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is considered to be one of the most important Catholic intellectuals and writers of the 20th century. Incredibly prolific and diverse, he wrote over 100 books. He is also co-founder with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger of the acclaimed theological journal, Communio. It is the purpose of this series of programs to introduce some of the themes of Balthasar's work, and perhaps to help some understand better why Hans Urs von Balthasar is so important for modern theology and for the lived experience of the Church today. Balthasar, Beauty, Goodness, Truth. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. In this episode, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Anthony Lillis, Academic Dean of St. Patrick's Seminary, located in Menlo Park, California. Dr. Lillis is the author of numerous books on the spiritual life and is widely considered a scholar of the Carmelite mystical tradition. We now begin part five of our conversation with Dr. Anthony Lillis. He puts an emphasis, doesn't he, the fact that we say yes, we assent, as in a, the nuptial uh, vow of you are asked and you say yes, as Mary did to the angel. We do that as well, don't we? In our reception of the word, we say yes. And this is kind of the essence of, of Christian meditation, where it's at its most unitive point. Um, Friendship is a union of wills. My will, when I begin to approach God, rather than being in friendship and union with his, my will starts out quite hostile to his. Uh, What he wants and what I want because of sin are two different things. But if I spend time in his company and I receive and I ponder him like Mary did, Mary is able to help me see how I can make my will say yes the way she did. And um, it's not a titanic effort where I white knuckle it and clench my teeth. Rather, it's a gift. But it's a gift that's difficult to receive because sometimes it takes a long time in prayer for uh, our wills finally to be submitted to his. But Mary gives us hope that if we persevere, and trust in him, the gift of having a, a, a friendship union of wills with God uh, can be realized in my heart. So whatever I meditate on, whatever the, the subject matter of my meditation, whether it's the moment of the, uh, the incarnation or the annunciation, or else the moment of the cross, or one of Jesus's miracles, or uh, earlier in this work, in fact, uh, uh, he He brought us to uh, Jesus in the very first part of of our reflections. He brought us to Jesus sitting in the temple with teachers of the law, uh, asking them questions and they being amazed by his answer and Mary and Joseph frantically searching for him. Learn to meditate like Mary is to also to suffer a frantic search for the Lord where it seems like we've lost him. And so there's a terrible battle. And as you draw closer to the Lord, the, this experience of union that we talked about, where you're not able to distinguish yourself from, uh, from God, uh, that's a moment in prayer. But for Christians, that is, uh, 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 there are other moments of prayer. And, and as you grow deeper into that union, following the way of Christ, what happened to Mary happens to us. As you draw closer to Christ, as Christ matures, he seems to be mysteriously absent in the book of Revelation. After the woman gives birth to the son, uh, the savior of the world. Uh, and so the, 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 in Roman, uh, excuse me, Revelations chapter 12, a baby is born. That baby is Jesus to save the world. Satan can't touch him, can't overcome him. But the woman, she's left on the earth and she runs out into the desert and she's protected out in the desert. And the woman is Mary, but the woman is also the church and the woman is also us. After we give birth 
in our hearts to the beautiful works that Christ is, is uh, conceived in us, those works will are caught up in heavenly splendor. But we end up out in the desert uh, uh, doing battle with the Satan, Satan, with him looking for us and, and trying to devour us. And, um, uh, and so this is another moment of Christian prayer. It's, very, it's a paradox. What I'm saying is, as you grow closer into union with God, rather than your creaturehood being completely lost in this kind of oblivion where you just experience the peace of, of this kind of total um, sublime identification with the divine entity, what instead the experience becomes one where he seems to be absent. To go into the desert is a lonely place. It's a place where you're tested and put beyond all your inner resources, where you need to rely completely on the Lord. Mysteriously, though, even though that's the case, and I know it sounds scary, it's not a nihilistic uh, or dreadful thing to go out into the desert, precisely because as you learn to rely on the Lord, the same thing that happened in the mystery of Mary happens to us. And what was that? If you follow Mary, and von Balthasar makes a brief reference to this, if you follow Mary through the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus mysteriously distances himself from her. Uh, at the wedding feast of Cana, she humbly goes to her son to ask, uh, ask him to save a couple from embarrassment. And his response seems to be almost cold. He calls her woman. Woman, what business is this of mine? It's not yet my time. And it seems like he was not going to answer her prayer. It seems like he uh, 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 kind of distanced himself from her maternal authority under him and uh, over him and was going to do his own thing regardless of what she wanted. And yet she learned in, that, in the appearance of that to trust him anyway. And so she sends the workers towards him and the time of sign and wonders, his public ministry, is inaugurated in that miracle. So she has a role. She starts the public ministry of Jesus. And then other part times, you know, somebody calls out, blessed is the womb that bore you, the breast that fed you. And Jesus, rather than saying, uh, yes, my, my mother who is blessed among all women, we should all call her blessed, he doesn't say that. He, he says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Similarly, another time, uh, your mother and your brothers are outside uh, waiting for you. And he, uh, who are my mother and brothers? And again, very similarly, uh, uh, you know, those who, who hear my teaching and, and follow them. This culminates, of course, on the cross. The beloved disciple stands with the mother of Jesus, Mary, who accompanied her son through it all, even though he seemed to be distancing himself from her at the foot of the cross, instead of calling her mother or saying some consoling thing to her, very nothing consoling comes out of Jesus's mouth at that moment. He looks at the disciple who he's, he loves and he says, behold your mother. And he looks to his mother and says, behold your son. And it says from that moment, the beloved disciple took her into his home. Mary had to surrender her motherhood of Jesus at the foot of the cross to become a new kind of mother that she could not possibly have understood in the shadow of the cross, but that would lead to um, uh, the, the great mystery of the church, uh, the church, the very apex, the highest moment of all creation, where, um, where the, the, the bride for whom Jesus lays down his life to make her holy and immaculate, Mary is implicated in that mystery in a singular way as mother and bride. And uh, that mysterious transformation happens because, and, and to go back through this, it happens because Jesus put her in the desert. He seemed to separate her, himself from her the whole way. He, he, there seemed to be an absence and a re, even a, a rejection, but it was only what seemed to be. 
I say all of this because as you advance in the life of prayer, as you come into union with Jesus, this experience of feeling the absence of the Lord, of seeming to be rejected to, by him, of standing in the face of the antithesis of everything you'd hoped for would be realized by him. This does not mean that you've made a mistake or that God has in fact rejected you or that um, the good work that he's begun in you has not been brought to completion. This is the very means by which Jesus is refashioning a new heavens and a new earth. And he's able to do it because in your prayer, in your meditation, you are willing to say yes. He goes on in this particular section, section three of Christian meditation, to, to do just as you've been describing. You begin with a Marian meditation. And we begin to see how we are incorporated in all of this through the person of Mary. And yet he moves us to from Marian meditation to ecclesial meditation. And just as, he, again, as you were talking about that, um, as he would say, now in the bridal oneness of Christ and the church as God-man and as the Father's word, he certainly remains active. He certainly remains the active word, capital W, in quite another way, above all in the free spontaneity of his Eucharist. So this is the, the great mystery unveiled to us every time we go to Mass. You know, uh, receiving communion uh, is, is uh, such a powerful and good thing. This is the food by which we're able to manage in our earthly way. But I would say even more important than receiving Holy Communion, or I don't know if I can say more important, but um, intrinsic to receiving Holy Communion, uh, what, what allows us to receive it, and even when we can't receive it, is, is, is still the greatest and most powerful thing that we can do as a human being, as a creature before God, is to participate in the Eucharistic liturgy, hearing uh, the readings, uh, uh, participating in the beginning with the, the prayers of asking for forgiveness and uh, and, and the great prayer of the church as the priest offers up the beginning of the mass, the, the, the readings themselves, the truth being poured through us and in us, questioning us, uh, encouraging us, admonishing us, establishing us in truth, and then fed by this holy truth through the divine readings, um, uh, our gifts are brought to the altar, all our our suffering, our pains, our inadequacies, our joys, uh, our accomplishments, our strengths, and our weaknesses are placed there on the altar uh, uh, in the symbol of bread and wine. And Jesus, uh, through the hands of the priests, lifts those up to the Father and joins them to himself in such a way that what is the drama of our hearts becomes part of the drama of his heart, even as he died for us on the cross, even as he stands at the right hand of the Father. And all of this takes up and sanctifies the world through our hearts participating with his in that moment. So that the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus that is now present on that altar is transforming something in the world through us being there, even before we receive Holy Communion. Us, a union of hearts with Jesus, uh, bound together by love and by hope and by common struggles, and Jesus treasuring all of that, not wanting any of it to be wasted, joining that to himself. And the Father looks on that and is delighted by that. Through our participation in the Eucharist, Jesus brings down the blessing of the Father on the whole world. For the Father sees the world in him and delights in it because his Son is beloved. And the Son, for his part, delighting in the Father, raises us up 
so that we all, not only we ourselves, but all those we love might find salvation. It's a powerful, powerful moment of recreation to say that Jesus is still at work in his church and especially in the Eucharist. This isn't pietistic twaddle or uh, some sort of nice wish to make us feel better. It is the deepest, most powerful reality that's happening right here and right now. And that's why it's so important to physically be at Mass to be embodied in our worship before the Lord so that with our hearts bound together with one another, we might uh, lift them up together to the Lord. This is what allows Jesus to act through us, to take our actions uh, to himself in a singular and irrepeatable way. Each mass is so singular, so irrepeatable, and so powerful. But our full conscious uh, participation must needs demand our presence, our, our personal full presence. And so how does Jesus work? And this opens up then to Christian meditation. He works through our freely given, fully present, personal presence to him that is open to, responsible is the word that Balthazar likes to use, completely available, generously available to whatever he wants to do. And you see in the beginning, we were talking about union with God's will. Our union with God's will is accomplished when Jesus communicates his love into us in a special way at the Eucharist. And in communicating his love to us in the Eucharist, something interiorly happens to us and we're not the same anymore. To speak about Christian meditation leading to union means a form of prayer, an effort at prayer that allows Jesus to accomplish this mystery in us. A final thought, Anthony. This uh, little book is a powerful, powerful little tool. It's obvious as you go through it that it's rooted in the spiritual exercises and it's really meant in many ways, for those who are going go through the spiritual exercises, I'd highly recommend reading this book. It puts you, you in the right disposition to take full advantage of those. But beyond the exercises, the long retreat of St. Ignatius, beyond those exercises, St. Ignatius says that a spiritual exercise is anything that allows us to raise our heart to God. And meditation is one of these things. And meditation can take so many forms. But Balthasar, at the end of his book, speaks about that our meditation can also be about the things that are going on in the world. Now, stewing and being anxious about what's working and what's not working or being caught up in the latest political fear, anxiety, or uh, rage uh, that uh, unfolds on our tele- that's not going to be prayer and that's not productive at all. But there are events that are happening right now, heartbreaking events that are happening, disturbing events. And Jesus in our prayer really wants us to surrender each and every one of those that troubles us to him and to surrender to it to him completely. And von Balthasar's argument for doing this is, as we've already looked at, the world and all the politics and all the difficulties in our families and the places of work and relationships that are falling apart and other relationships that are distracting us and and we're too attached to, uh, all of those things are struggles with things that we desire and we shouldn't and other things that we should desire and we don't, all of those struggles, surrender those to the Lord. Because the world with all the things that we desire in it and all the desires we have for them, the the world, this is not the obstacle to our union with God. These things that are in our heart that seem so difficult to suffer, if we will surrender them to the Lord, they become part of the pathway into union, a union that no power in heaven or on earth or under the earth can ever take away from us or overcome. 
Recently, I was talking to a scripture scholar about the Gospel of John in the prologue. And in the Gospel of John, he introduces a theme that comes through all of his writings. And that theme is, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Well, that English word overcome is maybe not exactly right. Uh, it doesn't convey the full sense. It, the, the word in Greek is grasp or to try to pull down, to try to hold. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness, it was unable to hold it back. In meditation, we gaze upon a light that the darkness of our times and the difficulties and the evil that we're in cannot hold back. Meditation is a pathway to freedom because it shows us Jesus and Jesus who is not held back by the world but shines forth in the world as a word of hope and truth. Jesus, he can help us get through the darkness that we suffer too. Meditation requires discipline and uh, daily practice, but if we will raise our hearts to him, there is nothing that God cannot achieve through us. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Lillis. Have a great day. God bless you. This concludes part five of our conversation with Dr. Anthony Lillis discussing Hans Urs von Balthasar's Christian Meditation. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with many other episodes of this particular series, visit vonbalthasar.com.